Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to cover a topic that not only supports an ancient earth and evolution, but also completely undermines creationism. It involves where organisms live and how those places change over time, so let's get to it. <laughs> Paleogeography is the study of geography in the geologic past. Over Earth's history, the continents have moved around, mountains have risen and eroded, sea levels have fluctuated, etc. And how the geography changed affected organisms. Remember that in my video, Biogeography, we got a brief overview of the concept that organisms adapt to specific locations. For instance, polar bears and penguins are adapted to living in very cold climates, whereas elephants are adapted to living in hot climates. We cannot simply drop elephants in Antarctica or polar bears in Africa and expect them to survive because their ancestors did not evolve in similar climatic conditions. This isn't a recent phenomenon, but extends all throughout life's history. Geologists have managed to work out the movements of continents over geologic history, and those movements correspond precisely with what's observed in the fossil record. For example, fossils of the Jurassic theropod dinosaur Torvosaurus have been found in North America and Portugal. But we know the dinosaur didn't swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Rather, a supercontinent called Pangaea previously existed that united North America to Europe, so Torvosaurus was able to traverse the now disconnected continents by foot. Another example is the animals of Hateg Island, which was where Romania now stands. In biology, it is understood that animals in areas with reduced amounts of food will often trend towards smaller sizes. This is especially apparent on islands, called insular dwarfism. For Hattag Island, many dinosaurs had been reduced in size, likely due to the reduced amount of food present. For example, titanosaurs are known as some of the largest dinosaurs to ever roam the Earth, but insular dwarfism caused Magyarosaurus to become quite small for a titanosaur. Ankylosaurs like Struthiosaurus, theropods like Balar, and Iguanodontids like Zalmoxis were similarly affected. There was even a strange hadrosaur called Tomatosaurus that possessed fairly primitive features despite existing so late in the Cretaceous. However, despite all of these small animals, the pterosaur Hatzegopteryx was affected by insular gigantism, becoming one of the largest flying animals of all time. Late in the Mesozoic, after Pangaea broke up, Asia became connected to North America by what is now the Bering Strait. Dinosaurs traveled across this land bridge between the continents, one example of which was the Ceratopsians. Ceratopsians are generally known as the horned dinosaurs, even though not all of them had horns. The earliest Ceratopsians hailed from the late Jurassic of Asia and were small, bipedal, hornless dinosaurs, including Yinlong around 158 million years ago and Chaoyangsaurus around 148 million years ago, which makes sense given that Ceratopsians are closely related to bipedal Ornithischians. Following these early forms, the earliest North American Ceratopsian fossils are dated to about 109 million years ago, such as Aquilops, and we observe that Ceratopsians get progressively larger and quadrupedal, from Leptoceratopsidae to Protoceratopsidae to Ceratopsoidea. Interestingly, we don't find Ceratopsians or other non-avian dinosaurs in Central North America from the Middle to Late Cretaceous. The reason for this being a body of water called the Western Interior Seaway. Instead of dinosaurs, we find sharks, long and short-necked plesiosaurs, giant sea turtles, and massive carnivorous squamates known as mosasaurs. What we see from the flora and fauna of the Western Interior Seaway is that it was a body of water that existed at a certain time in the geologic past and displays a certain set of organisms. Only Cretaceous organisms are found there. If all organisms were created together, then there is no reason we shouldn't expect whales and trilobites to be swimming right alongside those mosasaurs. However, we don't see that because these organisms occupied distinct geologic time periods that were separated from each other by millions of years. You must understand that this isn't an exhaustive list of examples of paleogeography. Such a list would take days to go through. 
Regardless, what we see from these examples alone is that organisms are subject to environmental conditions that change over this planet's long history. All the examples of paleogeography can't be crammed into six to 10,000 years, and a global flood because we don't see any signs of such events in geology, paleontology, or biology. What we see instead is a stratified layering of different environments and climatological conditions that changed over long stretches of time. For instance, we know that Antarctica was a desert and then tropical for a long time, as indicated by the early Triassic Dicynodont, Lystrosaurus, and the early Jurassic Theropod, Cryolophosaurus. Geologists have currently concluded that as the Eocene ended and the Oligocene began, the world experienced significant cooling trends, causing Antarctica to become covered with ice. What do creationists think happened? Do they think Antarctica was a desert for a little while, quickly became tropical, and then became completely frozen over? How long would that have taken in their minds, and what evidence can they cite to back up their claims? Anyway, we see that paleogeography is a great piece of evidence that the Earth is old. We also know that organisms must adapt to their environments, whether today or in the distant past, so evolution was certainly going on. That's all. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.